So we have local resident Charlie McCarthy here and he's going to talk to us. Um, you've been described as a, as a, a local maritime expert, Charlie. <laughs> Can you tell us a wee bit about Dundalk's maritime activities before the embankment was built? Before the embankment was built, that's the early 1700s. <laughs> I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, well, there was there was a port here from from that period anyhow, and certainly before that, but it wasn't a port as we know, it was just a creek where, uh, like a stream, and sh small ships came in and just uh, discharged their cargoes on the beach uh, between here and Dundalk, and uh, there was a little uh, quay right up at the big bridge but there's very little record or known anything known about it. You know where the monument is in the fair green? Yes. Well, that was the first little key that I know about. Uh, it was a little round circle of thing there, and ships would come in there, and just small little ships, and discharge their cargo into the north gate, as it was known then, into the town. But uh, So from that period, that's about all I can tell you, really, about the maritime life of it. Uh, very little. There was no newspapers or anything record recorded that I know of. <laughs> and Harold O'Sullivan, when he was alive, um, did a lot of research in the Tower of Dublin, of Tower of London, and uh, got very little information about the maritime life of Dundalk. Mm. So that's good to know. So um, would the embankment have had any impact then on Dundalk's maritime trade? No, no. The, the embankment the embankment was b built not to protect property or anything but to reclaim ground for farm farmer use that's why Lord uh, why he, Limerick did it uh, it was to reclaim it it's the third embankment believe it or not the first one was built that was built the second one was never built the first one ran from little shop up there at the where the the football teams are up there up that pint road here there was an embankment from there across to to hardy's house but uh, that goes through the end of the avenue road with the roundabout is and it went on then but it was a very small um, type of embankment but that stopped the tide getting in beyond that the tide at one time went right up to hill street that was all marshy up there. And uh, the late Chrissy McGee could tell me that. She lived on, at the, the McGee's Corner, as it's known, at the, the end of the Red Barns Road there on the Avenue Road. That was known as McGee's Corner because they lived there. But she knew about it. Um, Chrissy was a bit of a historian and she had some sort of records of it. But it's all disappeared. There's no trace of it now. And then. Lord Embankment, Lord Limerick built his embankment that we know of or know very little about and but then in the 1839 period there was a proposal to build a, an embankment from the big bridge out as far as the lighthouse and from that over to McGuigan's. You know where McGuigan's Rock is? No. It's um, it's where the when you go into Black Rock, the first where the flags are as you go into Black Rock, the first flags. That rock there is McGuigan's Rock, and there were uh, there was an intention to build a big embankment, and include include all that, and another embankment on the north side, on the other side of the river, out to the lighthouse and across to Lordship, but that was never built. From the big bridge, and that's yeah. what people call the Nary Bridge. Yeah, yeah. That was never built. It was money ran out, and there were the rest of it. Uh, the only part of it that was built is the Navy Bank. So well, the Navy Bank was originally intended to be uh, much greater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a tower. Yeah. Um, and do you know much about the Lord Limerick? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay, Charlie. I, I don't really know any case. more than yourself. Yeah. Um, um, and if you find out anything, I'd like to know. But um, no, I, I've, I've never really had much uh, attempt to 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 research anything about it because uh, 
it was always there sort of thing. Yes, yeah. But I know that it was, it was the story is that he, he used the castles that, are, that surrounded Dundalk and the walls. But that would have been just for a foundation for it because um, there would never have been enough of them to build it. I'd say parts of it were probably very marshy and he had to get stone for a foundation. But it's thrown up from mud and silt on either side of it. If you walk it, you can see where it was dug up either side and just thrown up from, from sand and mud. Mm. That's all it is. Mm. And, uh, Do you want to tell us about the history of the Coast Guard's cottages then? When did these come along? We're here now about over 30 years, 40 years, I suppose. Mm. But uh, these are here just over 200 years. Mm. They were built in 1805 by the revenue commissioners as f houses for the revenue uh, service. Um, that was to stop smuggling. Dundalk and the Cooley area was a very prominent smuggling area in, in the early 1800s. 1700s so um, these were built initially for revenue commissioners and in 1822 the revenue commission the, the customs and revenue commissioners was converted into the coast guard in all of Britain and Ireland to form the coast guards that have exist still really but uh, the houses were built on this ground uh, on lease from Lord Roden and um, uh, there were initially single story. This was all our house in the middle. That's the commander's house. He commanded the whole coast of County Loud from Amith right down to the Boyne. There was, uh, I think, nine Coast Guard stations. Uh, he was commander of them all. Mm. But the other houses were single, attached initially. And then in, uh, I think, 1848, the Thatch was taken off and they were raised to two-storey houses with slate roof on them. This was always slate roofed here, I think. Mm. And uh, the two end houses had castellated ends on them. Uh, they were lovely, apparently, but um, that was taken off and a pitched roof put on them. And uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, what kinds of cargo were we known for here? Charlie, what like what kinds of stuff would have been brought into Dundalk Harbour when it wasn't its its heyday? In, in mostly haberdash, I suppose you call it buttons and uh, belts and cloth and cloth and <laughs> and uh, and. Um, that's about all I can think of. No, no, no. But there was a lot of um, livestock and um, meat and pork and stuff shipped out from here. Uh, but it was, and grain, barley and wheat and stuff. That's really, uh, there was English cloth and linen brought in. Oh, I can't remember the names now, but there was, they had different names and stuff. Furs, I think it was one of them. Mm. Rough, rough cloth. That's all. And what's this say? Uh, I have it down here somewhere as well to tell us about the, the landmarks. The, wasn't there the baggage place just down there? Yeah, that was uh, initially the Coast Guard's lifeboat house. Mm. Uh, people claim it was the baggage sh store for the, for the steam packet, but no. Uh, it was built later than that, and uh, it was built initially for, by the Coast Guard uh, for their boat. The all Coast Guard stations had a little boat to enable them to enable them to uh, board ships and uh, search ships. And in later years, it was used for um, saving life and stuff. But that, that was a boat house, Coast Guard boat house. Long built by the Coast Guard station. On that subject, would you what you, what would you think about a, a you know a slipway there? There's been a few incidents over the years. Would mm. you be in favour of? I don't think the OPW has mentioned anything about that in their plans. What would you think about that? Yeah, but it it um, the problem the problem with Dundalk all the years ever since uh, it was formed as a coast as a harbour in 1840 was silting and. Uh, 
when I worked in the harbour, we looked at putting a silt uh, a s a slip down there, but um, we actually tried it. But the silt, it's not sewerage, it's silt. It comes down the river. It's a natural thing. It comes down the river. It's suspended might m m matter. It just fills it up in a, in a matter of months. Mm. So you'd never, ever be able to keep it clean. And it'd be, there'd be issues then with dredging in, in a European conservation yeah, area yeah, too. Yeah, you can't dredge anymore. No. And uh, so there was no way of getting, uh, there'd be no way of getting rid of it. We even looked up at the harbour, putting a slip up there. Uh, Captain Hughes, when he was harbour master, surveyed above the Danny Hughes, the, the, the Danny, uh, the, or the shop there, the, the place there, and um, above the quay. We, we survey the mud there, and um, there is a hard foundation, but um, you couldn't stop it silting up. You'd have to water run on it every day nearly to keep it clean, you know. Mm -hmm. It just wouldn't work. Um, I was reading up a bit uh, recently the the Soldier's Point. It's, I'm not going to do too much about the Soldier's Point, but that it was originally called the Point just for yeah. a very long time. Tell P -Y -O -N -T. us a bit about that. <laughs> Tell us a bit about that. Well, that was the name of it. It was just the point. This was... Uh, the whole way down was a big bank of shells and sand from from up near Coes Road. The whole way down was just... and it, The sand has been dredged away or dug away and used for building the town of Dundalk. It was all sand pits. When we came here, the... the, the, the CIE wouldn't let the bus come down here because the road would collapse because it was all undermined either side by sand pits, and uh, it was just known as the as the sand pint the pint, that's why. And uh, believe it or not, the road that you're looking at out there is not the original road at all. That was a little lane down to Maxwell's Salt Works, down at the behind the house there. Maxwell uh, had a salt, a salt works down there. The road ran the back of the houses, came down through the middle of the whole of the high area, down and behind these houses, and across the ridge, the, the, the river then at the ridge. And the pier on the other side, Tippins' pier, is built on the other end of the road. No way. Yeah, so that's. That's a bloody tower. <laughs> Um, what else is there for landmarks around here we can talk about? I see this. What's the anchor across the road? What's that in there? Oh, that's that's mine. I uh, I took that. That was an anchor used up in the quay for mooring the B and I ships, and uh, the harbour master was digging it. He was going to bury it, and I asked him could I have it. So <laughs> it's mine. I just give it to me, and I put it in there. I had it in here in the front of the house at one time, but then I moved it over there. You have to be living on the coast to get a spare yeah, anchor, yeah, don't yeah, you? Yeah. <laughs> You don't just fall upon yeah. them. Wait, let's see now what else we have. What is your favourite thing about living here? Oh, I don't know. Just that, um, as you, were, you mentioned, there's the wildlife and the natural environment. And uh, when the sewage treatment plant was been built we were worried that we'd have problems with the smell but we don't the prevailing winds blow it blow towards us so we only get the smell maybe once or twice a year so it doesn't bother us and we thought it would be a problem but no it's never developed into anything to worry about and um just the the location in itself i just like it that's all uh, it's peaceful, though there's no speed and traffic flying past or big lorries or anything to worry about. That's all. It's Couldn't bet it would have stuck down here, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to leave, leave it like that. <laughs> have you ever felt worried about flooding? No. No, I'll tell you about flooding. Um, it will come, I think, eventually, but uh, we'll never see it. Um, global warming, I went to work in the harbour 50 years ago and I can't understand this. I, I do believe there is global warming. I do believe the sea is probably rising. 
But what I don't understand, and I can't get anyone else to, to agree with or understand, and Liam, or um, I can't remember his name, but anyhow, when I worked during the winter, every winter, the key used to cover three or four times with, with, with the floods of big seas. And uh, it was always a problem. The key was covered at one time with a metre of water. That doesn't happen now. So where's this global water? Where, where's it it's gone? It's not coming this way. Uh, they didn't say it wouldn't happen again, but it's not happening. It's, it's getting better. And I don't understand it. Um, but you, we always had floods. We always had floods. There was a flood, the, that big flood I'm talking about. Um, it didn't cover this road here. It was three foot above the quay. It didn't cover this road. It came on. The whole area in front was flooded. And the road up here, uh, up the road a bit, was flooded. But um, no, I'm not worried about it. Um, it uh, when was that big flood? Oh, I think it was... Oh gosh. I think about eight, 1980. I think I, I haven't the date, but I know it was. But it was it was an accumulation of uh, heavy snow that suddenly thawed and flooded the river down, and then there was a southwesterly storm. Uh, if southwesterly storms on the south of England pushed the seas up the Irish Sea like a funnel, and then pushed them into Dundalk Bay like a funnel. And that combined with the the tod the the tod water coming down, and uh, with a predicted high tide, just all combined it into um, a. I th I can't remember the height it actually made, but it was. It was probably six point five meters high, and uh, six point six two to cover the key, so that's roughly what it was. Yeah. That used to happen in Carlingford as well when I was living there. Um, yeah. What would flood the village wouldn't actually be the lock so much, it would be the thaw from the mountain yeah, all yeah, thaw at once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I won't uh, disagree with anyone about it, but uh, I can't understand why it's not happening. Uh, it should be. I mean, we should be having floods nearly every year, but we don't have it anymore. We get an occasional one. But there's nothing like it used to be. Fifty years ago, there used to be. I lived in Black Rock, and uh, we used to have to uh, wait for the for the road to clear regularly to get into Dundalk at the bad turn there, the broken what we call the black broken turn. Um, that used to flood about a foot high. That doesn't happen anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know a lot of people don't. A lot of, a lot of people are worried about it, and maybe rightly so. But, but I, I don't worry because I don't see it happening, and I can't see it happening. Well, you're living here. I'm living here, you and I lived in Black Rock for most of my life as well, and uh, we lived right with the tide coming up to our back door, and it never <laughs> ever came in. Yeah. And I don't think it ever will. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's strange. There's still the odd picture of the, b the bad flooding on the on the rock road. Yeah. You would still see that happen the odd time, all mm. right. Mm. But uh, I've heard of people that has had it, you know, that's living sort of around this direction in town and has had it coming up their gardens now. But actually nailing these people down is a different story, you know. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there can be a lot of exaggeration about it. But um, I know there was, a couple of years ago, there was a good... A good rise, and uh, it did cover the Black Rock Road, but um, but that was when I was young. That was regular, you know, yeah. because it happened a couple of years ago. Everyone got um, uh, alarmed and everything about. But when I was young, that was regularly, mm. and we just took it as being the way life was. That time of year, you know, and it doesn't happen now. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Well, that's your honest account, Charlie. Is there a, is there anything else we left out there now? Is there anything else you can tell us about this <sighs> area? Any landmarks that stand out to you, or any part of the history even that's, that that no. you enjoy particularly, or no, I was mostly interested in the shipping, so you know, mm. the the development of the area. When 
when I was when I was young, when you came down here, you were looking at the tide here in front of me. The tide used to come in there. We have a photograph of boats anchored in front of the house here. You know, um, it was in 1933, I think, the first pumping station was built out there where the sewage plant is now, and that was a big thing, but it was, it was only a small little thing, really. And that was uh, to pump the sewage into the river on a tidal pump, a lunar pump, as it was called, but it never worked. It was supposed to pump the sewage out when the tide was going out, but it used to pump it out. <laughs> day and night it was every <laughs> randomly and it was never worked it was a disaster and it used to keep keep blogging clogging up and so then the sewage treatment plant was when they when they were building the sewage treatment plant they canvassed canvassed everybody down here about it you see and the alternative was the sewage treatment plant or um a housing estate so I reckon the sewage treatment plant would be a better option <laughs> for peace of mind and quietness. Yeah. And uh, it's quite, quite, quite agreeable now. No, we can't see it. We can't smell it. So <laughs> that's all. Yeah. Um, I can't think of anything else, Tara. That, um, that's uh, McClintock. I'm sure you know about McClintock, do you, the, the famous explorer? No. Yeah, well, he, Leo McClintock. Well done, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're from the dark, too. Yeah, I am indeed, yeah. Well, then you'd know. Uh, he, he, they were, McClintock's lived up um, in Seatown, big house, still there. But he was um, he was the man that, um, the famous Atlanta. There, there's lots of, look it up. But his father was 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 the inspector, uh, and he was based in the customs house up at the quay. The customs house up at the quay was born was built the same year this was built, by the same people. But that was his office. But his function was to inspect the the coast guard stations or, or the revenue stations as they were known, and he would come down from his house in Sea Town, uh, look at the books, uh, the books register all the ships coming in and the cargoes and everything else. He'd inspect those, and then he'd get on his horse and come down here and inspect us. And he would then cross the bay to Anigasson and inspect the Coast Guard station there. And he would ride ride then to um, Dunhaney, inspect the station there, then ride to Clarehead, and from Clarehead to Baltray. That'd be one day. And the other days he'd come, uh, he might come down here and he'd cross the river here on the horse. Like he'd cross, I walked across that river, you know, you can, in those days you could. Um, he'd walk on his horse and go out and check Giles' key. Then he'd go to Templeton, and then he'd go to Omeath, then he'd go to Carniford, and the Meath, and come back. That was his job. You want good weather for that, child? Well, he did it every year. Well, I suppose he just chose the day. He didn't have to do it every day, but he did it you know, once a week or once a month or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another uh, little addition to it. It's a terror to think all the all the jobs and all the positions that there would have been, and they were so important at the time. Yeah. You don't yeah. even know about them now unless you have someone like yeah. yourself telling us. Yeah. These Coast Guard people, um, they were they weren't locals. They were all ex Navy seamen, and um, they were armed as well. So they were like a, um, a navy, you know, an army or navy base here. It was. Across the road there, um, that's that came with this house. That's the present. There was a flagpole there, and the flag was always run up every morning, like a navy, like a military flag, and dropped every night. By the side post. And um, they also well, another thing behind here, um, there was a big cannon mentioned behind, mounted on a big platform behind the house here. Every coast guard station had a cannon to protect itself and protect the the harbour. And the big can at the back, it was a big 16 gun, a massive thing. It could fire shells as far as... Hold the mic up to you there, Charlie. Hold the mic. Just nearly as far as the lighthouse. And they used to practice regularly with it. it was a mo I saw photographs, and over in Ross's Point in Sligo, they had photographs of the one there. And they were massive, like they wouldn't fill this garden here, you know.
big, big brick. But uh, there's no reg- there's no trace or reg- there's no photograph or anything. But there was a sort of a a big raised platform at the back here, the end house, where the gun stood. And no sign of it left now at all. No, well that's all gone. No, there's no sign. Of we it. just have a, a shooting range instead. Hmm. We just have a shooting range yeah. instead. Wouldn't be much of a defence though, sure it would. <laughs> there were two shoot. There were two rifle ranges. There was the the gun club. There was a gun club in Dundalk, um, organised by all the businessmen, and uh, they had their own little gun club, and range beside it. And uh, the military one had the big one. And uh, they would come from. The military regiments from all over Ireland would come and uh, spend two weeks camped at Black Rock and uh, exercise there, fire their guns and exercise their guns there on the rifle range. I'd say the South would be a better defence for us these days. Mm. (laughs) There'd be no one coming near us with that. No. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever see Shepin and Dundalk Bay again? I don't think so, no. it's it's. I mean, it's happened. It's not just here. It's happening all over Ireland and England. Ships are getting bigger and small ports are just closing down. Um, I don't think I'd... I, the only reason Dundalk is surviving is because Sean Hanlon has developed into a business for his family, but when they finish, I don't think anyone will ever take it over, you know. Um... There's dozens of little ports like that everywhere, just abandoned and silter up. Yeah, it's a pity, but that's it. Life goes on, I suppose, doesn't it? Yeah. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> well, that's been brilliant, Charlie. I think we probably have everything we need there. Um, it was just kind of for the sake of being thorough. We needed to talk to somebody that knew about the scene. To mm-hmm. kind of prove the point that there's so little of a record really about any of it. You know? There is, yeah, I don't know. There, there may be, but um, you would need to be very good at it, at it to find the, the records. The, there, the problem is that they might be written down in, in Latin. Mm. They might be they're handwritten, and there, there's no catalog or index. You'd have to go through mountains of paperwork to find anything. There's, most of it is stored in the Tower of London, believe it or not, and how to get access to it. Now, Harold O'Sullivan um, was a great man. I was very friendly with Harold. Harold had access. It was amazing. He could. I would sit in the house with him and he'd just pick up the phone and speak to the Tower of London and ask, could he search for something? He, he used to go over and actually physically search, but, you know, you need to know what you're doing, and um, there's nobody of that calibre caliber anymore. Yeah. No one would get in the door. No one would get in the door. That's the other thing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's and all that stuff is lying there. I mean, the records of all the ports in Ireland. Uh, I had a friend called Brian Donnelly. He was the archivist in the in Customs House in Dublin, and all the customs uh, records uh, were gathered by him from all the ports. And uh, when he went to some of the ports, they had been dumped. Uh, most of the dark ones were dumped out in the dump out there. Um, the only two ports that he got complete records of were Waterford, and believe it or not, Drogheda had uh, good records, but uh, there was nothing, very little left on dark. None of Sligo, none of other places. But um, that's my phone. Sorry about that. Um, so, but Brian, I, w- I was in friendly, I went up to Brian to see could I get any records about them down. And he said, they're in there, he said, if you want to go in and look, they're in T-chess. And he had no staff to catalogue, and it's, as far as I know, they're still there, all lying in T-chess. And nobody, nobody can get in there to get them. But they're safe, I think. Whatever's left is safe. Where did you say this is? The Customs House in Dublin. Okay. Now, they may be moved from there. Brian is dead now, and I don't know. They may have moved them somewhere else, but... Um, uh, yeah, well, I can tell you now. Um, in when I worked in the harbour, the um, the harbour secretary and his sister lived in the harbour office, right. and they had lived initially downstairs in the cellar. There's a cellar in those houses, but what you're talking about earlier, 
the cellar flooded. Key Street, when, when I when I worked at the Key, Key Street used to flood every winter regularly. Go up and ask anyone now, and nobody will tell you that. But anyhow, they they their 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 living premises flooded, uh, so they moved upstairs, and all the furniture, everything was 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 destroyed. But apart from that, all the harbour records were in one of the rooms down where the, the cellars on s- shelves up high, and. Um, I went in. I had no interest in the history at the time. I went in, and I, so everything was musty and dusty and damp and wet. I went into this room, and all these ledgers were there, and I, just, I took them down. And, uh, records of the tugboat, towing ships, and cargoes, and everything else. So, uh, and, but not long afterwards, the roof started leaking, and the harbour master got McDermott's, the builders, to repair the roof. And when they were there, apparently Kathleen, the, the, the secretary's sister, uh, asked the lads to clear out all the old stuff that she had down in the cellar, that it was rotten, and uh, there was no, uh, she, got, she wanted rid of it. So I, I saw them doing this, putting them stuff, and I noticed them putting in um, a big book one day, and uh, I hadn't time to, to go and see what it was, but I went back uh, the next day and went down. Everything was gone, all the ledgers, everything, out into the into the dump. So I went out of the dump, but they had been bulldozed, bulldozed. Everything was buried, gone. So that's where they went. Jesus. So what got you into history then? When did you take an ocean? Ah, uh, well, when he died, the secretary uh, died. Uh, the harbour master, my harbour master, asked me to go over and clear out. He was a clutter. He cluttered and kept nothing, kept everything, and the place was covered with old documents and envelopes, books. Uh, he just when when you get a, a bill or anything, you just throw it. You know these spiky things, you just stick it there. So the hard master asked me to go over and clear it out, and um, I got interested in looking at all the stuff. And I opened the cell. The, 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 there's three three big safes, and I opened them, and there was all sorts of documents and deed maps and everything else. And uh, but then when I went down the back to the shed down at the back, an old old shed, uh, there was maps and letters, and the roof gone off it, and cats sleeping on it, and dogs sleeping on it, and cats pissing on it, and everything. The the maps, the ends of them were all rotten, where they they, they were up against the wall. So I went over to the harbour master. Oh, he says, dump them all. So I put them all in cardboard boxes and took them home and started researching them. And that's when I started. Good job someone did, Charlie. And most of it now is in the archives and that. But um, that's... And the minute books, um, I, I had access to them. I could... You know, you had, it was hard to read some of them, but I had access to them when I worked there and I used to take one home and read it and leave it back. They're all now in the archives, up in in in, in the R D Road. There's not many of them, but most of them are most of the ones that were there uh, are there. Um, the R D Road. Mm. Yeah, there's 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 stuff up there that was salvaged. And uh, whereabouts? Yes. Where's the archive up there? Uh, when you pass the guard barracks. Yeah. On the right-hand side, there's a, a door in the wall. That's the archives in there. No, I always wondered what that door yeah. was. I go live in on Dublin Street. Go in and tell Lorraine that you're researching. And, but you need to know what... You, again, she has a staff in there, but she need to know... You kind of have to make a, make an appointment, you know. But yeah. Lorraine will entertain right. you. I have a good excuse. Yeah. That's all I can tell you now. That's a terrible Jeez, Shall we learn loads, Charlie? Well, I'm glad because I didn't know what the right thing to tell you. There's not a huge amount to tell um, from what I gather. There's just there's nothing was written down about the you know the old history of this embankment, mm. and as you say, a lot of the the goings on and what went on around it has disappeared mm. or been filed away. 